Welcome. Or as they say in the ancient tongue, Elen Sila, Lumen Mentielvo. A star shines on the hour of our meeting. And tonight it shines most brightly. For tonight we speak of a man, John Ronald Rule Tolkien, who knew that elven star and its pure light. It is a star to which the silent longings of many mortals go, though they glimpse it only briefly, perhaps in sleep or dream, or in a quickly passing vision that pierces even bright day with a strangely blinding light. J.R.R. Tolkien has emerged as one of the most important and enduring literary figures of the 20th century. His masterwork, The Lord of the Rings, has now become one of the most printed and perhaps also one of the most read, and the two do not always go together, works of fiction in all history. At last count, as I understood, there were over 150 million copies of The Lord of the Rings in print and about 100 million copies of The Hobbit. Most of his fans know that Tolkien was a philologist and professor of English language at Oxford, but very few readers appreciate the intensity with which he explored the beauty and the perils of his imaginative world before ever starting down the road that led from the Shire to Mount Doom, a decade-long labor of writing The Lord of the Rings that he began in 1937. That story, the Hobbit story, began for Tolkien as a trifle, as a diversion on the periphery of his creative project. But since it's the part of his history that most people come aware of, let me start there. Around 1930, Tolkien, professor at Oxford, was doing one of the tasks he most hated, correcting exam papers. As he went through the booklets one by one, he opened an exam booklet and noted that the student had left it completely blank. As he mused upon this situation, he was startled to note that upon the page he had written some words. In a hole, there lived a hobbit. He looked and pondered. What hole? And what's a hobbit? Tolkien was a man of active imaginations, and at this time he had many young children at home, four to be exact. He often told them stories at night, and he took this image of a hobbit living in a hole and began to develop it in nighttime tales. As it developed, as it progressed, as he discovered it, it became more interesting to him, and he began taking manuscript notes. The first to hear the story of the Hobbit there and back again were, of course, Tolkien's children. The second audience to hear it was a gathering of distinguished Oxford dons known as the Inklings, a group that gathered at C.S. Lewis's rooms at Magdalen College on Thursday evening for dinner and drinks and drinks and pipes and stories. He had no particular intention of publishing it, but word of the manuscript reached another young woman who worked for a publisher uh, in London, George Allen and Unwin. And she asked if she could look at the manuscript and then if she could pass it along to uh, Stanley Unwin. When Unwin, Stanley Unwin saw the manuscript, he thought it interesting, an interesting work of juvenile fiction. And for an um, evaluation of its literary merits, he handed it to his 10-year-old son, Rainer, and asked him to write a book report. Rainer took well to the book, and he thought his father should publish it. Stanley Unwin sent Rayner's book report back with the manuscript to Tolkien and requested rights of publication. In the fall of 1937, The Hobbit was published. And it was a success by the modest standards of juvenile literature in England in 1937. Uh, the publisher contacted Tolkien in a letter in October of that year and said, we have a success on our hands. And by next year, the public will be exclaiming for more 
Hobbit stories. Well, Tolkien considered this letter, and his reply was, although I am flattered, I'm a little perturbed. I cannot think of anything more to say about hobbits. But I have only too much to say, and much already written, about the world into which the hobbits intruded. The world into which the hobbits intruded. It's nine o'clock. For over 20 years, in 1937, at the time of publication of The Hobbit, Tolkien had been fully immersed in one of the most extraordinary imaginative experiences, to my knowledge, in human record. Stacked in his office were dozens of manuscripts, written, rewritten, folios, illustrations, illuminated documents, summaries of elven languages and grammars and word lists, all completed privately in an imaginative enterprise that had begun around 1914. That was the world into which hobbits had intruded. The story of a hobbit had begun as a trifle, a diversion on the periphery of Tolkien's creative focus, a children's story. Tolkien collected some of these writings that he had been working on, some of his imaginative creation, works he called generally the Silmarillion and sent a few of the manuscripts off to Stanley Unwin. They were given to a reviewer who gave them a distinctive thumbs down. The publisher responded politely that they were interesting, but he did not think that they were suitable presently for publication in their current form. Tolkien had expected no more. And so in December of 1937, he began to write a story which he called the second Hobbit story. He really didn't think he had anything more to say about Hobbits. He struggled with the beginning. His original character was a fellow by the name of Bingo, who gratefully morphed into Frodo as the manuscript progressed. He and a group of Hobbits had started on a road out of the Shire across the Great Hedge, and they had with them a magic ring that Bingo, Frodo, had received. What the ring was, its importance, was unclear. As they progressed along the road, suddenly things started to happen imaginatively for Tolkien. He said, by the time we had reached Bree, I had then no more no notion than they, the hobbits had, of what had become of Gandalf, or who Strider was the figure sitting in the dark corner of the prancing pony. And unexpectedly, there had appeared upon the road a black rider. When he first appeared imaginatively, Tolkien thought it was Gandalf in disguise, and then realized it was not. By the mid-year of 1938 and the ends of 1938, Tolkien had realized that he had begun a journey that was not a children's story. He had realized that the hobbits had indeed intruded into a mythology, but that now this journey, called forth by a hobbit about a ring, was the culmination, the capstone, of a mythology that, in his mind, in his imagination, had been growing for 30 years. And he turned to it with renewed effort. The journey took him over 12 years. I suspect that most of you here have read The Lord of the Rings, and probably most also The Hobbit. And it is not necessarily to those works that I wish to turn today, but it's to that other imaginative work of Tolkien, the work that prepared the ground for The Hobbit, the work to which his masterwork, The Lord of the Rings, was culmination, capstone, completion. I want to talk to you a little bit about the life of Tolkien, but more prominently and in more focused fashion, the imaginative life of Tolkien. Of course, one needs not know anything about the life of an author to appreciate 
his artistic creation. Indeed, if it were necessary, it would probably lessen the enjoyment of his art. And Tolkien himself objected. He said, I object to the contemporary trend in criticism with its excessive interest in the details of the lives of authors and artists that that only distract attention from the author's works and end, as one now often sees, in becoming the main interest. But only one's guardian angel, or indeed God himself, could unravel the real relationship between personal facts and an author's work. Not the author himself, though he knows more than any investigator, and certainly not the so-called psychologists. Looking at Tolkien's personal details, events, outward facts, we will not unravel his life. And nor do I wish to attempt to define the source of his creative events in outward fact, in outward process of life. Because indeed, his creative work came from a place deeply within. But to appreciate that imaginative act, to appreciate that imaginative creation, I think it is wise for us to turn to a history of his life. In this series of three lectures, I shall divide up my focus to the early life of Tolkien, which we will approach tonight. In the second lecture, we're going to look at his midlife, the period around the time of the beginnings of the Lord of the Ring, the period in which he was defining for the first time to the world his imaginative experience. And particularly, we will focus upon the essay he published at that time to explain himself. It's called On Fairy Stories. In the third lecture, we'll look at Tolkien's place in the imaginative traditions of the West and try to put him in a context of understanding. And in that lecture, we might also talk about Carl Gustav Jung and his own experience of the imagination. And so to the beginning. John Ronald Rule Tolkien was born in Bloemfontein in the Orange Free State on January the 3rd of 1892. His father, an Englishman, and his mother had gone to South Africa to make their fortune. Bloemfontein was a uh, desolate place and in a hostile country, at least hostile to the Englishman because it was Boerland. And the heat was oppressive, and indeed Tolkien as a child did not take it very well. When he was aged four, his mother returned on home leave to England to visit family, the Suffield family in Warwickshire. And during her visit, her husband remaining in Bloemfontein became suddenly ill and died. Tolkien's family was left destitute. His father had left only a few shares in a South African gold mine. They had hardly any income, and they depended very much upon the support of the family. His mother took the children to a small cottage in a place called Sar Hole in Warwickshire, south of the industrial town of Birmingham. At that time, this was still a rural hamlet. If Tolkien in later life would compare anything he had known to the Shire, he would compare this hamlet of Sarhol. This was his own central place and the place from which he felt the exile. His mother, Mabel Suffield, Tolkien, was an educated and very creative woman. And his early education was really in her hands. She spoke several languages, and by the time Tolkien entered school, he knew both English, of course, well, and Latin, and French, and some German, although he states that he never really liked French. It was a taste that persisted throughout his life, or shall we say a distaste. In 1900, when Tolkien started school, the family had to move from the rural region where they had lived closer in to a place where he could get his education. In 1900, they moved back to Birmingham, and from that point on lived in great poverty in what we might indeed call tenement dwellings in this day. Something else happened in that year of 1900 when Tolkien was eight and started school. His mother apparently had a deep spiritual instinct or need, and she had been thinking for a long time about a religious conversion from her Anglican faith to Roman Catholicism. She decided in 1900 that she had to do it, and indeed she did. This was to the complete rejection of her family 
upon whom she had depended for financial and moral support. And nonetheless, she felt strongly that she had to follow that path. Tolkien always looked upon this act of faith of his mother as a great gift to him, for he adopted and held sacred that religious tradition throughout his life. But then, when Tolkien was 12 years of age, his mother, too, became ill, developed diabetes, a disease which in that day had no treatment, and in 1904 lapsed into a diabetic coma and died, leaving Tolkien and his young brother, Hillary, orphaned. She had left Tolkien and Hillary in the keeping of the family priest, and he was the guardian and agent caring for Tolkien throughout his childhood life. Tolkien was boarded from place to place from that time on. He entered the old Edwardian school, and certainly he was no wallflower. He was a, a very good student, of course, and had a particular affinity, talent for language. He was also a distinguished rugby player, distinguished, they say, by his complete unwillingness to ever back down. In school, Tolkien found deep and important relationships with others. And this is a quality uh, of Tolkien that you really have to understand. It, it, it travels throughout his life. Tolkien sought fellowship. He was an extremely internal, introverted person. He had very, very private elements, but he also had a deep social need of sharing. And throughout his life, he tended to find a few, one or two, or perhaps three like-minded fellows. In school, there were three, and they became soulmates, dear and close friends. Tolkien was, of course, the only Roman Catholic, but they all shared, and indeed this is a quality, again, that runs throughout Tolkien's life. They all shared a sense of a divine reality and a sense of moral obligation, a sense that they had something to do in the world, a purpose. Not only was there fun, but there were moments of very deep communication between these boys. They really developed a loving brotherhood, full of antics and argument, but full of support and caring. And then again in these years, something else happened. When Tolkien was 16, once again, he moved. His guardian, Father Francis Morgan, moved him to a new boarding house along with Hillary. He thought it might be more suitable for the boy. Well, it was. There was another boarder in the house. Her name was Edith. She was a young girl, age 19, three years older than Tolkien, and also an orphan. She had lost her mother when she was about 13, and her father she had never known. Tolkien had not had many female associations at that time in his young adolescent life, but Edith was special and they became soon close friends and within a year had begun to understand that they deeply loved one another. This was a bit of a problem, however, and had to be kept under cover. At night, they would sneak out their windows and whistle to each other and hold conversations late into the night. Uh, in the day, they would ride off in different directions on their bicycles and try to find a little place where they could sit together for tea. But of course, word got back eventually Tolkien's guardian deeply disapproved, as might be understood. He forbade John Ronald from seeing Edith any further and mandated that he move. When it was found out that even after the move, they were sneaking visits, Father Francis put his foot down and said that he would be cut off if he did not obey and no longer see Edith until his 21st birthday. Tolkien was at this time 19. He was a year away from entering Oxford, and he really had no choice, and so he cut off all contact with Edith. But she remained his love, and for those many years between his 18th and his 21st birthday, she was the focus of his heart, though he could say nothing to her, not even send her a letter. Tolkien reared Oxford when he was 19. He undertook the study of classics, which actually was a subject that rather bored him. He already knew the classics. He was fully fluent in the literature of the Greek and Latin worlds. And his first two years of Oxford, uh, well, 
Tolkien's to tutor said of him that uh, he was a distinguished student, but distinguished principally by his laziness. He wrapped himself up in the social structure of things, and he also took private moments to begin exploring a new and developing interior creative mode. This creative development played both in art, visual art, and in language. Let me start with the pictures. I mean, maybe, maybe I can give you a, an image of what was going on. Tolkien's mother had uh, been the child, uh, the daughter of an engraver. And she was a good artist. And Tolkien had begun drawing at a very early age. Up through about 1912, when Tolkien is 19 to 20 years old, his art is mainly topographical. Images of the exterior world. And his art actually is some of it pretty good. Then around 1912, something happens. He senses a need to begin drawing not what he sees on the outside, but what he saw on the inside. He purchased a little book just for these drawings. He called them Ishness. And suddenly, these images start appearing. In 1912, this is the one of the most startling. The first in his, of his Ishness drawings. Two pillars, flames, a dark passage, and a doorway. Primitive, quick, sort of a statement of the deep dream world. And then it's followed in the book by this one. Afterwards, the figure is passed down that passage through the torches, and we see out through a door into a strange, mysterious nighttime landscape. And this one, this is my favorite, the end of the world. One commenter stated that this was a rather depressing theme, a, a poor fellow stepping off a cliff. But I see it entirely differently. This is really where Tolkien was in 1913. Things were cooking in this young man's imagination. He had turned into an imaginary realm. He had passed through a doorway. And now he was at the edge of what was known. And if you look at that little figure, he's not about to step off. That fellow has stepped. But he's not falling. He's walking into a sun, into a moon, into stars. And this one, eeriness. On that journey, we have strange things happening. Once again, these are all the interior images that he's suddenly starting to draw. Here we have a wizard, wouldn't you say? And he's carrying a staff. He's surrounded by a halo of light. He's passing into an old forest on a dark road. These are the images that Tolkien is beginning to play with. At this time, something else very important happened, of course. Uh, he was united with Edith. On January the 2nd, the eve of his 21st birthday, he sat in his room composing a letter to her asking when they could be joined before man and God. And on his 21st birthday, the day of his obligation's end, he mailed her that letter. A few days later, he received in the post the message that she was sorry, but she had thought he had forgotten her, and she was already engaged. Tolkien got on a train, went to her house, knocked on the door, and explained that indeed she had not been forgotten. They were eventually betrothed, but they could not then marry. Tolkien still had two more years of university studies. He was penniless, as was she. He had to have a job and a way of supporting her before they could marry. This period, 1913, after his return to Edith, the beginning of these drawings, something is absolutely exploding in the imaginative world of John Ronald Rule Tolkien. I showed you the pictures. But there was something else going on, something also artistic, but of a different type. Tolkien called it, in later years, my secret vice. Tolkien had begun playing imaginatively with words. I don't know exactly how to explain it, because it's an experience that has very few analogs anywhere that I have been able to find. Indeed, Tolkien himself found only hint that one other person had so experienced word. How shall I explain it? Well, 
In younger years, he had played word games with two of his cousins. Uh, the, the first word game they had played was called uh, Animalish, in which they substituted animal names for various words. So by various combinations, one could express simple short thoughts. Um, one of his cousins became a little bit more interested in um, a more progressive development of this game. And they started pro developing a real language. Tolkien then found an interest in this. And after all others had lost interest, continued at levels of complexity, increasing and deepening. The best I can describe it is in terms of music. If you can imagine, for example, a young Mozart hearing melodies in his head in combinations in forms never before heard. Bringing out of that imagination small works, greater works, masterworks over a period of development. Where did it come from? They seemed simply there. Such was Tolkien's experience of word. He had an aesthetic ear for language. It came to him like music, not just in its sound, but certainly in sound, but also in its form and transformation, in its case structure, in the way that verbs shifted and word orders played. When he first heard Old Anglo-Saxon, also called Old English, he said he immediately felt as if he knew it. And he thought he had inherited the sympathy in his blood, in the blood of his mother's family, who had been from the West Midlands for many, many centuries. Then he discovered Gothic. Gothic is a dead language. Hardly any of it survived. You've heard the story of the Attila the Hun, the Huns and Goths. Well, the Goths lost. Attila won. And as a result, most Gothic culture and most language disappeared. But a few fragments survived, and Tolkien found the language beautiful in his ear. As he started playing with it, he found uh, a need to try to express himself in Gothic. But the problem was, uh, well, there weren't many words. The vocabularies of Gothic were extremely limited. So he started inventing the words he needed in Gothic. I mean, he knew the feel of the language. He knew the melody, the key, the mode. And words started coming to him, roots. And from these, he developed morphological transformations. At this time, he was completing his second year at Oxford, <clears throat> and it had, uh, had to take his second year exam in classics, in which he did not do well. Uh, he did not get a first class. His uh, professors, uh, since he was a scholarship student, this was a bit of a disaster, and his professors suggested to him that perhaps he had chosen the wrong area of study. There were, however, classes that he had taken in philology, the study of language, the love of words. And these uh, classes he had excelled in, and his professors had noted an extraordinary talent. And so he switched from classics in 1913 to the study of word, philology. At Oxford at this time, there was a division between the study of literature and language. And it's a distinction that is, is pretty much lost in our own age. Literature was the study of the creative use of a language to produce works of written form. Language was the study of the creation and history of word itself. And it was to philology that Tolkien was attracted. This whole concept of, uh, of philology is a study, and, and I'll take a minute to talk about this simply because Tolkien was a philologist, and you should understand what he did. This study of philology had developed in the 17th century in its beginnings. When travelers from India had returned, noting that in Sanskrit, there were words very much like Greek. The study had developed over uh, two to three hundred years, and it had been determined that across a large spectrum of languages called the Indo-European language family, many words seemed to have common source. Not only did they have common source, but there were laws ways in which they went through change, mutation, transformation. And there was a history of meaning in these words. Now, this was philology. Tolkien 
was interested in words. Yes, but he was interested in what human beings had expressed with words. And the only way to understand that, really, was to look at the literature, the stories of a people, of a land, of a culture. And this is what Tolkien did. He, he, he then discovered Finnish and Old Norse and the myths, the Kalevala and the other myths of, of the ancient northern peoples, and he was fascinated by them. And at the same time, as a student of music might, he felt a need also not just to study the works of others, but to create. Study the works of others? Yes, he studied Finnish and Icelandic and Old English, Middle English. He studied them as a musician might study previous musical creations. But he also wanted to create, to create his own language from the beginning. And that he did. The words began to come to him. And he would play with them, find the roots, find the transformations, develop a sense of the grammar of this new language. And as the language developed, he began to sense that somebody had spoken this language, that he was discovering something which existed, although, of course, existed in his creative space, his imaginative space, but nonetheless, which was real. He discovered a word, Earandil, in an old Middle English text. The word rang in his ear, Earandil. Aesthetically, it appealed. In 1914, he was walking on the Cornish coast, looking at the sea, and returned to his rooms deeply moved, and sat down to write. And he wrote a poem about one Earandil. In its original form, it read, Earandil sprang up from the ocean's cup, in gloom of the mid-world's rim, from the door of night, as a ray of light leapt over the twilight brim, and launching his bark like a silver spark from the golden fading sand, down the sunlight breath of day's fiery death, he sped from Westerland. The poem is much longer. That's a sample. In the poem's continuation, Arundel sails westward into the firmaments into the sky itself. Well, <clears throat> Tolkien's friends, I mentioned, the TCBS, he called them, the Tea Club and Barovian Society, his three close friends from school, had remained his friends in college years. And they often communicated and shared their literary works. And he sent to G.B. Smith, one of his close friends, this poem, and asked, what do you think? And G.B. Smith wrote back, well, it's interesting. But what's it about? And Tolkien wrote back, I don't know. I'll try to find out. There encapsulated in those few words is Tolkien's experience of imagination. He didn't say, oh, well, let me think about it. I'll make something up. I will create a solution. Uh-uh. I will discover. I will investigate. I will find out. I will find out. And so this imaginative process was spinning around Tolkien. The words, the new language, the stories. Who speaks this tongue? And what is their story? He came to determine that those who spoke the tongue were the elves. Indeed, they spoke many tongues, and many tongues he came to know and to create. And they indeed had a story, and he began to hear it. He began to imagine names and words, places. Not only did he imagine them linguistically, but he imagined them visually. One of his first poems from 1914, he called Cortirian Among the Trees. It's about an elfin city 
on a place called Tol Erasea, the Lonely Isle. All of these concepts, once again, forming in his mythological conception. O fading town upon an inland hill, old shadows linger in thine ancient gate. Thy robe is gray, thine old heart now is still, thy towers silent in the mist await. One day and then another to the sea, and slowly thither many years have gone since first the elves here built Court Tyrion. And tolling faintly over windy miles, to my heart calls no distant bell that rings in crowded cities of earthly kings. For here is heart's ease still, and deep content, though sadness haunt the land of withered elms. And making music still in sweet lament, the elves here holy and immortal dwell. And on the stones and trees there lies a spell. It isn't great poetry, but it is an expression of what was going on in this young man's mind. And the pictures came along with it. Tanakui, he called this one in early 1915. Later, he would change the name to Tanik Watil. An elven city upon a hill surrounded by the oceans. A tall tower. East of the moon, west of the sun, there stands a lonely hill. Its feet are in pale green sea. Its towers are white and still. Beyond Tanik Watil in Valinor, no stars come there but one alone that hunted with the moon from there the two trees naked grow that bear night's silver bloom that bear the globed fruit of noon in Valinor. There are the shores of Ferry. And the picture. Two trees bearing globe of moon light of noon a tower in the distance. Tolkien said later, speaking for myself as a child, I can only say that a liking for fairy stories was not a dominant characteristic of early taste. A real taste for fairy stories was awakened by philology on the threshold of manhood and quickened to full life by war. And of course, at this point, there was a war. In August of 1914, war had erupted. Oxford was cleared out by the young volunteers. Tolkien, however, despite immense social pressures, felt he could not leave his studies at that time. There was Edith. There was the need to complete a degree, to marry. And so he delayed his enrollment until completion of his final exams in 1915. He graduated with the first class, which pretty much assured him an academic career, if, if he survived the war. Edith and John Ronald Rule Tolkien were married in 1916. She's beautiful, isn't she? He really thought of her as a fairy princess. In 1916, and Tolkien soon thereafter shipped out. A major advance was about to begin. It was called the Battle of the Somme River. It began in July of 1916, and Tolkien, along with two of his other best friends, arrived just in time. The Battle of the Somme was one of the most horrendous of World War I. On the first day of the assault, 20,000 English men died. The next day, 10,000 more. Lines of trenches faced each other across no man land expanses of a few hundred or more meters of barbed wire. And they ran from one trench to another through the artillery, through the barbed wire, into the machine guns, and often into certain death. Tolkien was a signal officer. His job was to try to maintain some sort of communication between the front lines and the rear in the midst 
of hellish chaos and battle. He later wrote that if there was any experience he had that might be reflected in an image found in the Lord of the Rings, it was the dead marshes and the Battle of the Somme. Rob Gilson was a gentle poet, one of Tolkien's three great friends from school. Rob died in the second week of battle, serving also with the Lancashire Fusiliers, as did Tolkien. He carried in his pocket throughout the war a copy of Tolkien's poem, Quartirian Among the Trees. It was precious to him. He felt that something was happening. Something beautiful was happening in Tolkien. G.B. Smith died a few months later, struck by shrapnel. He thought he had what was known as the blighty wound, the wound that got you out of battle, returned you to England, but did not kill you. But in three days, he was dead of the toxemia of gas gangrene. A few days before his death, Jeffrey Smith had written Tolkien a letter. And I would read you the whole letter, but I've found over the years that I can't read it without tears streaming down my face, so I'll abbreviate it. He said, I'm off on duty in a few hours, and if I die tonight, I take solace that some of the great TCBS, the Brotherhood of Friends, will remain to dream the dreams, to accomplish the dreams that we shared. Tolkien's blighty wound was different. It was an infestation of lice that bred trench fever. By November, when he fell sick with fever and was returned to England, close to a half million men had died at the Battle of the Somme, German and English both. And Tolkien had been amidst it. He returned to England in 1916 sick with fever, but expected to recover within a few weeks to months, as people usually did with trench fever as the infection cleared. And he had been sent back to England with a letter from his commanding officer that he was badly needed and should be returned as soon as possible to the front. And he returned with these words in his mind. Right. Right. My dear John Ronald, say the things that we would have said. He returned to England in 1916, and the stories, the images, the elfin languages were overwhelming in his mind, and he did begin immediately to write. Speaking of this period, he says, the tales. They arose in my mind as given things. And as they came, separately, so too the links grew, an absorbing, though continually interrupted labor, especially even apart from the necessities of life, since the mind would wing to the other pole and spread itself on the elven linguistics. Yet always I had the sense of recording what was already there somewhere, not of inventing, of finding out, of finding out. Given things already there somewhere. This is the ringer. It's the issue that always confounds people. Something already there, given. You know, when we talk about imagination, well, imagination is uh, it's what you make up. Imagination is a type of, of lie, a fantasy. It's not real. Many of us have fantasies or imaginations. Often they are reorderings of things of our, our world, reorderings of situations, 
But you see, the working material, the raw material that we're working with, we perceive of as our own creation. It's as if we have a repository of information we have received. And we're reaching into that repository and pulling out and then reordering in the creative act. That is not what Tolkien was doing. Tolkien felt that he had found a passage, a strange passage. He had walked through a door into what was clearly an imaginative realm. It was a land he called fairy, using the old Middle English word for fairy, spelled in the old form to distinguish it, fairy. He had walked into that realm. And there was an autonomous reality, a given. He perceived it. And he made attempts to record it. He knew its languages. Indeed, during this period, he was writing some poems in elfin tongues. And not just one elfin tongue, because you see, the elfin folk had a history of millennia. And their language had undergone transformations in those millennia. And so, by end, Tolkien had five or six different branches of the elfin tongue, which he had mastered linguistically phonetically different languages. And the stories came. Given. They've now been published in a book called The Book of Lost Tales. Let me interject a footnote here. When Tolkien died in 1973, I believe it was, he had been working ever since completion of The Lord of the Rings to publish this material, this creative explosion of material that had come to him in the years near and after the Great War and could not accomplish it. His son knew how badly he wanted this published, and so a few years after his father's death, Christopher Tolkien, his literary executor and a very faithful serpent of the man's literary uh, legacy, Christopher published a book called The Silmarillion in which he took a few samples of these writings and tried to put them into a stable format. But he soon came to see the effort to have been a mistake because Tolkien's work during this period was never a static and completed fact. It was a continuous creative flow, continually changing, continually being reimagined, continually being rewritten. And so Christopher Tolkien saw that what he really needed to do is actually publish it all. And all was a lot. Now most of Tolkien's writings have been collected, have been edited and annotated, as is necessary by Christopher Tolkien, and published, and I believe the History of Middle-earth now runs to 12 volumes. The first two volumes of the History of Middle-earth are called the Book of Lost Tales. And these are the books, the story that uh, Tolkien conceived as a whole and that was authored upon his return from the Somme in 1916. I think I have enough time to tell you a few of these stories. Let me start with the first story. The first story he told was of Tour and the fall of Gondolin. He wrote it in an old school notebook, cheap scrap paper notebook. He wrote it quickly in pencil. It was begun shortly after he arrived back in England from the battle in December of 1916, and then January and February of 1917. The story he called The Fall of Gondolin. In it, there are echoes of a much deeper mythology. And as he said, these stories kept appearing. They came as givens. Each one had information that he did not quite understand. Names and references. But as they came one by one, he saw that they were linked. Gondolin's a peculiar story from a psychological standpoint, one might say. It's about a young man, Tuor, who lives in the shadow of a great evil, Morgoth, in the first age. One day in his travels, he finds a lake and a stream flowing from that lake. The stream flows into an underground cavern, and he decides to follow it. And so he follows this water into the deep earth and travels long along its cool banks. Finally, he emerges. In the distance, he smells something new, the sea and ventures to the sea. There a spirit power comes to him, a spirit of water, a water-type god, 
and tells him of a place called Gondul, to which he must now venture. Gondolin. In the Sindarin tongue, that means the singing stone. Gond is stone, Lind is song in Elven. Tor is a mortal human. Gondolin is a city surrounded by a perfect ring of rock, high mountains. And there in the middle of that circle, there is one high peak, and upon that sits the city of Gondolin. Morgoth, the Dark Lord, is searching for control and for destruction of the entire world, but Gondolin has been hidden from him. And in those circled mountains, there lives an elven community in peace and art and beauty. Tuer struggles through a venture up to the encircling mountains. There's a magic door that leads through the mountains into Gondolin. It can only be found by elven hands, and he finds elves who help him, who open the door. He ventures in. He enters the circle. He sees in the distance the town at the center point and goes there. He falls in love with, of course, the daughter of the king. They marry. They have a child. That child's name is Earendil. And he will have a history as well. Morgoth discovers through treachery the existence of Gondolin and sends his mechanized dragons of fire across the mountains. Tuor has sensed the coming of this destruction. He has created an escape tunnel, and he and his wife and his son, Earendil, escape back to the sea. It's an amazing image. I share these stories with you only to give you a, a taste of them, because I think you should indeed look into these original tales of Tolkien, if the man interests you. Even more amazing was his myth of creation itself. It's called the music of the Ainu. Because as Tolkien imagined his world, he imagined it from the very beginning. Now, a cosmogonic myth, cosmogonic means a myth of the creation of cosmos. Cosmogonic myths are relatively unusual. In criticism of mythology, they are sometimes referred to as stories told by people about how humankind came to consciousness. And Tolkien had a most unusual cosmogonic myth descend upon him. In the beginning, there was a first source. It was called Iluvatar. Iluvatar was all alone in one, the single. Iluvatar was the beginning. And beyond that, no wisdom of the Valar, or of Eldar, or of men can go. Who was Iluvatar, said Ariel. Was he of the gods? Nay, said Rumil, that he was not, for he made them. Iluvatar is the Lord for always, who dwells beyond the world. Tolkien, in his image of the telling of these myths, had a link, an image of himself, perhaps, an image of a voyager who he called Ariel. Ariel meant one who dreams alone. Later, he changed his name to Elfvin, which means elf friend. As Tolkien's mythology developed, he had the sense of Ariel, who had found a way to sail across the Western Sea, to the land of the gods, to Valinor, to Valar. He went to Tol Erisea, the lonely isle, where exiled elves dwelt. And there they had a story hall. Ariel was invited in. And night by night, he sat before the tale fire and heard the stories of the elves. And this was one of them. Rumi was the old elvish philologist, the developer of the uh, first uh, written forms of uh, elven language. Rumiel is telling this story to Ariel. Iluvatar, the one and alone, wishes, thinks something else. He thinks music. He wishes to hear his own melody. 
and from Iluvatar emanate a series of powers who are called the Ainur, Ainur, the Ainur sing. Their music word, their music creation. And in it comes a great harmony, like a symphony. But in the symphony, suddenly arises dissonance, chaos, confusion. Luthar holds up his right hand and it stops. And then it begins again in harmony, completeness, beauty. And then again, a voice of chaos enters, discord. Luthar holds up his left hand. And it starts again, once again, unity, descending under the force of one of the Ainur, one of the voices of the divine, Melko. Under the force of Melko, again, in to chaos. Despite the dissonance, Eluvatar calls the Ainur and asks them to come and look, see what they have done. Eluvatar takes the Ainur, the creative voices, the music of creation, out. And now when they reached the midmost void, they beheld a sight of surpassing beauty and wonder. There before had been emptiness. But the Luvatar said, Behold, your quarry and your music. Each one herein will find contained within the design that is mine the adornments and embellishments that he himself devised. One thing only have I added, the fire that giveth life and reality. And behold, the secret fire burnt at the heart of the world. The fire of life and reality. Some of the Ainur were drawn in to this creative fold. They descended into Arla, the created world. And there they were called the Valar, a word we might interpret as the first gods. Each came with quality. Manwe, spirit of air. Varda, queen of heaven, of starlight. Her name in the Sindarin tongue is Elbereth Gilthonia. You'll remember those words in exclamation in The Lord of the Rings. Star maker, star queen, Elbereth Gilthoniel. That's their Sindarin name, and the Varda is the name in the uh, Quenya dialect of Elven, which is the older dialect that Tol Tolkien is here using. Uno, a spirit of water. Aule, a spirit of earth and creation of matter. And Melko, a spirit of fire and ice and destruction and dissonance. They come with syzygies, with female counterparts. To Aule, there is Ivana, Palur, mother of the living. It's an amazing mythology. Indeed, I, reading his creation mythology, I can think of only one analog in Western religious history, and that is the creation myth of the prophet Mani in the third century. Parallels I will not here try to draw for you, but they are there, and they are extraordinary. In this created world in which the Valar had descended, there was no light. The light was gloaming around, scintillating. The Valar wished to collect it, and so they did. It was collected into two great lamps. For these, Melko, the spirit of discord, of fire and ice, built towers to bear the light, but the towers were made of ice, and when Aule had collected the light and placed it on the great towers, they melted, and the light was lost in the world. Then came the task of the regathering of the light. And so the Valar went. They collected the light that had fallen into pools across the earth and brought it together. Now in the midmost vale, they digged two great pits. In one did Olmo set seven rocks of gold, and a fragment was cast thereafter of the lamp that had burned a while upon the south. This pit was covered with rich earths that Palurian Yavana devised. And Vana sang the song of spring upon the mound and danced upon it and watered it with great streams of golden light that Olmo had brought from that spilled lake. But in the other pit, 
they cast three huge pearls, and a small star Varda cast after them, and they covered it with foams and white mists, and thereafter sprinkled lightly earth upon it. But Lorien, who loved twilights and flitterings and shadows, sat nigh and whispered noiseless words. And the gods poured upon that place rivers of white radiance and silver light. Then Palurian sings and weaves spells about the two places. First a golden tree, Lorien arises. Even before it flowers, the light it gives is wide and fair. But then it puts forth blossom in exceeding great profusion, so that all its boughs were hidden by long swaying clusters of golden flowers, and light spilled upon the tips of these. Then hours later, the white tree Silpion emerges. Its flowers were as silver and pearl, and glittering stars burnt with white light, and it seemed as if the, as if the tree's heart throbbed and its radiance wavered thereto. And as one tree lighted, the other waxed. And at the turning, there was a wondrous gloaming, a mixing of gold and silver and mingled lights. A strange, strange story of light. That's Tolkien's creation mystery. If I were to characterize his cosmogonic myth, his mythology of the coming of world, I would say that it's a story of a coming and a loss and a renewal of light brings us quickly to the story of the Silmaril. This is all happening, you see, ages, ages before the awakening of the children of the Luvitar, of the elves, or of the men, ages before their awakening. Eventually the elves awake. They are the firstborn, born under the stars. It is discovered by the Valar, the gods that the elves have awakened. A messenger is sent out to them, and they are requested to come to Valinor, to the land of the gods, to dwell with them. And they do. One of the elves, Feanor, is a master craftsman, and he learns from Aule, the Valar force of alchemy, mastery. He's fascinated by the light of the trees, and he wishes to make of them something. He makes, indeed, the first of all gems, but the gem he wishes to make is a gem that encapsulates the light of the trees, of Lorien, of Silpian. And so he does. By subtle and great magic craft from a great pearl and luminous phosphor light gathered in dark places, and all the gems he had hence created, and the radiant dew of Silpion, and a single drop of the light of Larian, he mixes. And he has just enough of this magic mixture to yield three great gems of light the Silmaril. Feanor loves them. He loves their light. He loves his creation. Well, there's another person that's interested in that light, too. His name is Melko, that voice of dissonance. Because Melko also wants light, but he wants to own it. He wants to consume it, and he hungers after the light of the Silmaril. He seeks out an ally in his quest, an ancient dark force, a primeval spirit called Moru, who, Tolkien says, even the Valar know not whence or when she came. But more like has always been. And she it is who loveth still to dwell in that dark place, taking the guise of an unlovely spider, spinning a clinging gossamer of gloom that catches in its mesh stars and moons, and all bright things that sail the airs. For she sucked light greedily, and it fed her. But she brought forth only darkness that is a denial of all light. Her names are many. The Nodoli speak of her as Ungoliant, the spider. So here in this creation myth, a darkness from outside of creation enters in. And what does it hunger for? Light. Light is the life. 
Melkor wants the Silmaril, created by elven hands, holding within them eternal light. And so, with the help of Moru, Ungoliant, the great vampire of light, he attacks. He takes Ungoliant to the Garden of the Trees, Silpian and Lorlin, and there she sinks her fangs into the tree and drains them of their light. And then, in that shadow of darkness, Melko steals the Silmaril and escapes from the land of the gods from Valinor into his new realm it's ten of Middle Earth. And Ungoliant, where she goes, she returns to her dark dwelling spots. But she had progeny, distant, distant, distant generations, in much diminished form. One of her children lived near Mount Doom. Her name was Shelah. A religion of light, a story of light, Tolkien's creation myth of light. Elen Sila Lumen Nomen Tielvo. Tolkien's words. May a star shine on the hour of our meeting. After The Lord of the Rings was published, many people kept asking Tolkien, what is it really about? And he was quite irritated by the repeated questions. And he developed what he considered his perfect answer, as he wrote in a letter to his son. He said, I was asked the question again, and I replied, I needed to express a world where Elen si la lumen, omenti elvo, would be seen as an appropriate greeting. And so he did. Elen si a star, Elen, Sila, Sil, light, Silpion, light, the elven grammar, you see. And what was this light? What was that star? The star was cast in those heavens by the hand of Varda. Elbareth Gilfonian. That light had been collected in the gloaming by the first gods. That light had been attacked by the vampire of a spider who would drink it and destroy it. It had been encrystallated in a silmaril which had become the prize of elf masters and the treasure of a dark lord, Morgoth. Light. There's one other story that, that Tolkien wrote at this time. It's the story of Baron in Luthien, Tenuvia, and I'll abbreviate it. This is a story that Tolkien worked on repeatedly. He wrote it in prose and alliterative and rhyming couplet form. It has many, many, many recensions in his work. It was at the center of his heart. Baron is immortal. It's in the last part of what later became known as the First Age. At this time in Tolkien's mythology, there was only one age. It was the beginning. Baron had worked as an outlaw in the forests, fighting the dark power of Morgoth, the name that Melko had taken in Middle-earth. His band had been destroyed by the agents of that darkness, and he had ventured long and far across waste to a legend place called Doriath, a land where elves yet dwelt in peace. Thingol, the king of Doriath, was one of the elves who had not gone to Valinor when the elves were called upon their awakening. Instead, he had wed a spirit, Melian, a spirit of nature, of light. And there their kingdom existed, and by Melian's spell it was protected from the dark gaze of Morgoth. Baron went to the land, and there on the borderlands, he encountered a mystery. Luthien Tinuviel was dancing. And in her dance, flowers blossomed, the trees waved, light flowed, life began. Of course, Baron fell immediately in love with Luthien, and they dwelt there together for some time in the woods. Eventually, Baron had to go to the father of Luthien, Tinuviel, Fingal, the king, and ask for her hand. Well, this was quite an insult. Luthien, Tinuviel was half-elf and actually half-goddess. 
one might say, because her mother's lineage was not Elfin, but with Valar. And Thingol was quite insulted, and he told Baron that he could not have her hand unless he went to the castle of the dark master Morgoth, who had stolen the Silmaril and had placed the three jewels in his iron crown where they sat. Unless Baron went to that castle and brought back a Silmaril from the iron crown of Morgoth, he could not have the hand of Luthien to Nuviel. Baron looked at the king, Thingold, and said, you value your daughter far too cheaply, and set off for the Dark Lord's realm. And there he went. The story is long. It's actually a wonderful story. Eventually, Luthien comes to his aid after he's imprisoned by Morgoth, and it is by her enchantment that eventually they are able to steal the Silmaril and return it from that kingdom. But in the return journey, back to Doriath, back to the king, a werewolf servant of Morgoth follows them. And that werewolf attacks Beren. As he bears the Silmaril in his left hand, the werewolf bites off his hand and swallows hand and Silmaril. Of course, the light of the jewel drives the poor werewolf, if one can say such things of werewolves, nasty werewolf, uh, to distraction. And he goes off howling, screaming. Baron returns to Thingol, the king, and he says, I've come to claim the daughter that you promised, the hand of Luthien Tenuvia. And Thingol says to him, well, where's the Silmaril? Of course, Baron's response was, I have kept my promise. I bear a Silmaril in my hand. <laughs> it was true. It's just that the hand was in the belly of the werewolf. Eventually, they capture the werewolf. And in the final battle, with that werewolf, Baron, trying to recover hand and Silmaril, is mortally wounded and dies. Elves are immortal. Men die. That's the gift of a Luvatar to man, to humankind. They die. Luthien is distraught. She goes to Mandos, the halls of the great Valar, Lord King of the Dark Afterlife, and pleads for Baron that they may be again united. And Mandos says that indeed, yes, they may, if Luthien forsakes her elven quality and she becomes mortal, and they together return as mortal to surely die. She accepts this pledge, and they return together to this earth. How seriously did Tolkien take this created mythology? What was it to him, these givens, in their first formings between 1914 and 1925? When Tolkien died in 1973, he was buried beside Edith in a small cemetery near Oxford. His wife had preceded him in death by two years. He wrote, he wrote a letter to his son asking permission to do something very special with their gravestones. He wanted to inscribe under Edith's name, the name Luthien. And under his own name, the name Baron. And he said to his son in the letter, she was my Luthien, and she knew it. Now, that's not to say their marriage was always happy, because it was not. It had its conflicts. But she was his Luthien. And so today, that stone stands. Edith Tolkien, Luthien. John Ronald Rule Tolkien, Baron. Givens, 
these myths were to him. And so, in 1930, a hobbit intruded. And it is to the story of that hobbit intrusion, to the story of how Tolkien handled his own creative experience that we will turn in the coming lecture. And so I thank you very much for your attention tonight, and I hope to see some of you next time. Thank you.